Uh, welcome to the March 2nd, 2022 meeting of the Finance Subcommittee of the Brookline School Committee. Um, we're going to jump right into the agenda. First item is user fees, um, review and possible vote. Um, why don't we start with a motion and a second, and then we can get into some of the discussion and Regina's presentation. So I will um, move the document. Is there a second? Thanks, Stephen. I'll what, David? I was just going to second if Stephen didn't, but that's fine. Okay, thanks. Um, Regina, do you want to talk a little bit um, about the proposed um, increase to the BEEP tuition and the contextualization of that? Actually, I think Sam is going to be uh, presenting Hi. about that. And I'm here to answer more specific questions about, you know, details about BEEP as needed. Okay, great. Sam. Thank you. I appreciate that, Regina. So, uh, yes, um, I had met. Actually, uh, I meet uh, with Regina and Beep on a monthly basis to see where we are with enrollment and, and budget, uh, which are, are closely related. And in, the, and, and in that process, preparing uh, for uh, what fee increase to have given um, the amount of money you know, if you look at our listing of fees, I think second to what we charge for school lunch, um, which is over $3 million, the next largest fee uh, is, is uh, revenue it base is, is beep at, at about, you know, $2.6 million, maybe two and a half million this year. And so, um, when we look at that, you know, it's very important uh, relative, you know, it, the fees generate um, roughly, you know, looking at the program in it, its entirety, probably about 40% of the, of the uh, overall program that is BEEP. And so with that, um, first thing we looked at is um, how do we benchmark? And what we found interesting is within uh, private programs in the confines of Brookline, uh, we're in the ballpark of, of what those fees are. Uh, when looking at uh, other public schools, which clearly are in other, other municipalities, there's, there's only the public schools of Brookline and in Brookline, uh, we are on the high side. And so the feeling was when we, when we, and the other thing uh, that is tied to, uh, I think previous discussions with respect to uh, financial assistance is these fees at the level of revenue that, that, we, that we collect uh, allow the BEAT program to offer 40 of its seats uh, for a hundred percent waiver of tuition, and and that and then the budget is balanced on that. Uh, so that's not to be uh, that's not to be minimized um, because BEEP basically uh, funds that through tuition. And so um, again, sensitive to the benchmarking, um, the two percent increase represents that. Um, Costs do go up in BEEP. In fact, year over year, the, the increases will be, uh, all things being equal, probably more in the magnitude of 4% largely that uh, when you think of annual wage step and lane, and most of the, most of the operating expenses of BEEP are, are personnel and, and largely unit A personnel uh, in dollars. 2% uh, is sort of a nod to uh, threading the needle uh, within, you know, trying to be sensitive to people's pocketbooks at the same time as uh, being sensitive to uh, creating enough revenue that we can continue to offer the 40 tuition-free seats uh, that, that have already been subscribed. Uh, 
according to Regina's registration is being uh, largely finalized uh, as I'm speaking. Uh, so at least that, I think that gives some context of where our, our collective minds were at in uh, determining a percent increase for next year. Thanks, Sam. Do you wanna talk about um, any of the other buckets beyond BEEP at all? Um, we had talked about this for the first time a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things we had flagged was the international student tuition, and that's been revised since our last conversation, if I recall correctly, Sam, right? That, that is correct. I think we slotted that or two or three percent, and the feeling was is um, five percent uh, that you had recommended was more a more in line with what the full increase year over year is, certainly if you measure by inflation, maybe that's even a little low. And uh, given uh, the kind of clientele that would be coming in, uh, there's no reason for Brookline to be subsidizing out of its operating budget the, the incremental increase in costs year over year. And so that, that was taken into account. Uh, over and above those increases, nothing else really uh, was changed. I think certainly there were areas that were questioned. Uh, one was the summer school program, and that is going to be an in-person uh, program. That was because it was virtual before, and that was a question asked. Um, I think school lunch, there was questions asked around, you know, how is the pricing relative to our culinary program? That's been aligned. And we just had a meeting with Britt Stevens and Sasha Palmer to just verify, validate that there is alignment between the two programs. And I think those were the most important things that were brought up. Oh, and lastly, um, and again, this is something, and I thank you, Mariah, because this isn't unique to Brookline, but uh, it's something that you suggested it. I followed up with uh, Desi, and they followed up with USDA. And um, this is something we look to do is free and reduced lunch. I mean, yeah, the free uh, reduced is what I'm really speaking of, just for people to understand. Uh, the concept of free and reduced lunch, if you meet in the guidelines for USDA, uh, the poverty guidelines, if you, if you as a family make hundred less than 130% of the federal poverty line, um, you're considered free, uh, free lunch, free breakfast. If you make between 130 and 185 percent of the of the, the poverty line, which I would argue in Massachusetts and specifically uh, in the town of Brookline, uh, people would find it very difficult to live uh, on those numbers. Um, you would have to pay 30 cents for breakfast and 40 cents for lunch, and while that is very small percentage of the full cost. Uh, for some families, 30 and 40 cents might be for 30 and 40 cents too much. And so what Mariah had asked and we validated can be done and will be done uh, is that starting next year, assuming that nobody's eating for free, 100% of people are not eating for free like they are this year, that we would waive the 30, everybody who qualifies for reduced would pay no, no money and that that cost would be subsidized out of, the, out of the financial assistance program. I think first of all, the amount of subsidy would be somewhat slight and the amount of additional participation uh, by people who otherwise wouldn't would more than make up the subsidy. And so that's something I wanted to report here. And, and we I need to amend this document, correct? We would have to because right now it actually has a fee for reduced. So we would just need to strike that because it was generated before we had that conversation last week. I mean, either that or we put a footnote that says, I mean, those are the fees, but they would be subsidized by the financial assist. Nobody would, we, we can talk about how to, how to frame it, but yeah, that would be the intent that nobody 
who is eligible for free or reduced breakfast and lunch would pay a fee uh, for either. Because this is, a, I think, a document, according to the policies, this is a document which is meant to be student facing, so to speak. And so I think it would be good that it was clear that Agreed. that fee does, you know what I mean? That that fee is not to be paid by anyone. We can change that, certainly. Okay. Suzanne? Yeah, thanks, Mariah. I just, I just know in the past, my experience has been it's sometimes really hard to get families to fill out these forms. Uh, and so is that, will it require an application? I guess it will. It would, yes. Yeah, yeah. And since they haven't done it for a couple of years, we may need a campaign of sorts, some marketing to get families to understand that they are entitled and need to fill out the application. Your point is very well taken, Suzanne, and thank you for that reminder. This ties also, Suzanne, to the idea of streamlining the application as well and removing it, for example, by address, just sort of blanket approving those people rather than having um, specific, uh, having everyone have to fill in an application anyway. Yeah. So, but that's not in this, like in this box of the vote dollar amount, but you're right, it's another issue to, to talk about. Helen? Are you saying they don't have to fill out forms to do it? I think they're required by the feds. I'm not sure, but we had talked about having streamlining at minimum the application to make it less complicated. And for example, having people who have an address in BHA um, get, get automatically approved. Now, if there's a form that has to be filled in, we'll cross that bridge, but whatever we can do to minimize and streamline to increase the number of students who are, um, who are in these programs who would benefit from them. I, I think what we can do is anybody who qualifies for free and reduced lunch could then qualify for all the rest. They you know, would automatically, how they would automatically right. qualify. They, they for I think other. they already do. But anyway, yeah. that's, I mean, this is just about the fees, not about the process. So, yeah. but yes, there's other questions about the process. That, that, that wasn't my question. Could oh, I, sorry, go ahead. That's okay. I just wanted to, and the other thing that we could do to help uh, facilitate filling out these forms is maybe get steps to success to help us with that, the, the advisors from STEPS Inc who, who talk with the parents all the time might be a way to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> the uh, summer school, it, it's always run in the red in the past. I don't know what happened last summer. I don't know if we got a report or not. I'm wondering, <clears throat> the, do you know, Sam? I know I sat with the program director, at least the person who, and, and Donna, you'll help me um, because you sat also with us. And I think the feeling was if the full cost of the program, the fees don't cover it. I think that's yeah. clear. Um, I think fortunately this past year, you know, I helped uh, in the, initiate and we got a, a grant from DESE that would cover at least for one year summer programming. But to your point, I think I'm pretty sure, and, and I'll circle back, this was built in, and it's good Renan is here too, is I think we did build in for 23 some amount of this program to be funded out of the operating budget, taking into account that the revenues aren't going to cover the whole cost. Is that correct, Renan? That's correct, Sam. Uh, we do have uh, the summer program budgeted. I can check the amount if you guys would like, if you bear with me for, for a few minutes. Sure. I mean, one of the things, I, you know, if it's, I, there are students that aren't Brookline students who go to this program. And one question might be, do we have, you know, a separate, um, a cost for those who are taking courses that are not Brookline students. Um, Maybe one way to help with that deficit. Um, but we need to, you need to sort of, you know, sort of go into the program and figure out what's happening, where they're at today, what they're offering. Do they offer courses if there's less than, I don't know, five kids or whatever. Understood. You know, those sorts of, so, I, I guess my, my request, uh, Mariah, is to sort of look into this program and see how we can 
maybe at least bring it to break even. Yeah, I'll have to work with, I'm sorry, I'll work with the program director, um, but again, probably through the high school principal, uh, given that this is a high school program. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But it's it, just so you're aware, I don't think it ever was in the black. Okay. Susan, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> No, but it's a different model now, so it's hard to compare. Okay. Helen, just so I have clarity, are you wanting this for this fee vote or for going forward? Are you wanting it to be, are you, is your goal to have it go break even for summer 22 or is that something that it's a multi-year thing? I, I think that may not happen for this year, but I would okay. like us to start working on it. And I guess uh, the one thing I would ask is maybe we want to change the cost for non-residents. You know, it's a $400 per course, I think, for residents, maybe make it 500 for non-residents. As a, as a, you know, I'm not sure how many there are, but in the past, there were courses that we were offering that kids from outside Brookline would take us very few school systems run summer program. one request and i think i'm gonna i'm gonna park this as a multi-year thing and leslie are you there leslie she was okay hi um i'm here <laughs> i just wanted to say that i know that curriculum talks about summer programs i think earlier in the year and maybe really what we want to do is have summer programs come up on both on in both subcommittees or in a joint meeting to talk about some of these questions and sort of make it like a a holistic view into what the summer programs, what we want them to be and what they are, yeah. rather than, does that make sense? But to put a pin in that for when planning comes around for FY, for summer 23 next year, and just then do it from that perspective. Yes, um, and I'm certainly happy to give an update just as to where we are with um, summer school. Um, certainly in the K to eight realm, um, we've had a lot of movement lately. We've just gotten um, save the dates out. We've got to save the dates out maybe two or three weeks ago. Um, we already have a number of students signed. We had invitations between Star Academy and Project Discovery go out to over a thousand students. Um, and just um, FYI, we did write um, the summer programming for this summer into Title I. So Title I is covering a good portion of that. And is Universal Summer Program or some variation thereof happening? This is Project Discovery and Star Academy. But is there a universal summer program happening? There is not a universal summer program happening. I think we discussed that, I think, at a school committee meeting prior. So universal summer program means that we have to be able to offer summer programming to every single student in the public schools of Brookline. So that's what we learned through uh, our experience last year. Um, and that's just not, it's not feasible to um, ensure that we can do that for every student in the public schools of Brookline. I don't know if we did discuss this as a full school committee or maybe I'm the only person surprised. Helen, am I the only person surprised? Are you surprised too? You, yes, you are, okay. We, well, no, I can I, say- we did, we, we did discuss we this. Did. I can't remember if it was at a full committee or a subcommittee, but we did talk about uh, that we would be offering summer programming. And I was very uh, specific about not using the universal language for the very reasons that Leslie is talking about now. And I remember- I think, that, Helen... I think that discussion of not using the universal language, but, but um, expanding our offerings beyond those things was, but anyway, that's not a finance issue um, necessarily. So maybe we can park it for now. And, and we do have- we do have expanded offerings. So we are inviting way more students than we've invited in the past, but it is not under the umbrella of universal summer programming. I see, because that was what we had talked about was increasing the number of students who have access, even if it wasn't under the same program banners. Okay. Steven, I see your hands up. Thanks, Mariah. I just have a few questions for my own clarification. Um, Sam, can you, just let me know why the subcategories under the revolving budget are different in the budget book than in this fees document. 
Um, well, let me, I have the budget book here. So. There are just a lot more categories in the. In oh, the sure, budget. because I think in the budget book, we didn't want to get to, I mean, I'll call it immaterial amounts given the sheer size of, of the budget that overall, you know, it's near to $150 million all in. And so we spoke to the, and again, bear with me, please. Yeah, so here we are. So in revolving, we, we have, you know, the seven large- no, you, you answered me. Like if you just wanted to have the, main, the big ticket items in the budget book, that makes sense to me. That that's it. I mean, we could have had another category for all others, and, and well, so it out. my other question is related. Sam, is there is there any change then in the to first of all, what is the total of fees? I I'm, I couldn't find it in this document. What is um, the there isn't the sum total of all the categories, which certainly we can draw a total of that. I mean, it's you know it yeah looking. And again, unfortunately, in the document, there's a range, but then we put basic specialty. There's a range because depending on how quickly we recover from the pandemic, you know, it could be anywhere. I think the document shows, um, we budget, you know, I think we budgeted, tell you in a minute. Well, let, me, let me tell you why I'm asking because maybe there's sure. a question. I just, I just want to know if there's any substantive change between what's currently projected for revenues resulting from fees and what was presented in the budget book. For 23 or for 22? For 23. For I would say no. The only place that has potential for change uh, based on the latest uh, the latest presentation by base, 500 is a bit conservative. That number could rise. It was, you know, late, latest projection for 23 on the presentation could be about half again more, 750. Um, other than that, the numbers you see uh, really haven't moved, nor have they changed. Okay, so we're still looking between seven two and seven four, say. That is like, correct. Okay. Um, another question for clarification. I'm starting to ask you to go over this again. I actually didn't really understand your explanation, the explanation of the rationale for the BEEP 2% sure. hike, uh, especially when you said that, that the program costs are all, if I, if I, tell me if I misheard, are already high. Would you mind recapping it briefly? I'm sorry. Sure. If I'm no, and, no that's, that's quite all right. So, I mean, I have the BEEP current budgets in front of me. And um, yeah, the, um, so again, we budget, you know, there's the revolver in BEEP and then there's the operating budget in BEEP. And when you add both together, uh, my number was accurate. It's roughly a $6 million operation. And, you know, of the 6 million, 60% of it is, is raised by the taxpayers of Brookline. And the other 40% is raised by users uh, that aren't on a, on a scholarship. And, uh, and so that $6 million cost the 60% of it is already factored in. The increased cost related to 60% of the program is already factored in and put in our $130.6 million ask. The $2.4 million that's covered, the 40% covered by fees uh, is roughly gonna rise at the same rate as the other 60, the program, the program is the program. Um, what we're advocating or recommending for a fee increase at this time is, you know, not the same rate. It's a, you know, and that's a nod to Brookline residents are paying these fees, unlike the other fee that's 5% increase where people from out of, out of the country are paying. Residents are paying and um, given where we are, uh, relative to other public school districts, not the privates, but other public school districts, 
we wanted to be a little sensitive in moderating that increase and felt we could, at least for this year, moderate the increase in a, at 2%. We don't typically, sorry, the. And maybe I was confused by the revolving fee fund chart of beep tuition from FY18 through the present. It looks like there was only one increase previously. So are we saying that there's another one that's necessary now to catch up because, because we don't Wait, have annual increases? Well, there are two fees. Um, there's the summer enrichment, which we're not talking about. The, oh, you're the right. Lion's share is the pre the preschool has gone up every year, year over year. I'm looking at that same sheet. I see, I see. It was 10 to 82, then 10. It went up 2% in 19. It went up 4% in 20. It went up 3% in 21. You're and right. My yeah. mistake, Sam. I understand now. Thank you. Okay. Susan, Stephen, do you mind putting your hand down? Thank you. Yeah, just following on that. Um, so I really appreciate this conversation. I think it's really helpful. And I definitely understand the idea of benchmarking both against other public school systems, which we've done in the past a little bit, but primarily we've benchmarked against other Brookline systems, both um, early education. And I'm mindful, Regina, I'm hopefully I'll get the words right. Some are early education programs and some really are more daycare. Um, and there's, it's not that those aren't education minded, but they really are quite different models in terms of what they're trying to accomplish and how many hours they have and, and, and whatnot. So whether, whether they have unions that they work with. Um, so there really are a lot of differences between us and the different kinds of private providers, um, both nonprofit private providers and for-profit private providers and early education providers and daycare providers. Anyway, it is sort of a complicated landscape, even just within Brooklyn. And I remember Regina presentation you did a number of years ago that there were like 16 of them and you kind of ranked us as to kind of where we were. Um, and if I recall at the time, sort of strategically our goal and correct me if I'm wrong, but our goal strategically, and this may be up for revision, but at the time was to say like, we definitely don't wanna be like in the top quartile. We definitely don't wanna be in the bottom half because of the quality of our program. So somewhere between you know 50 and 75 percentile in Brookline seemed to more or less make sense. Um, so I don't know if we're still there kind of as a conceptually speaking kind of thing. Um, but I guess the other question that I had was, so, so it'd be helpful to know kind of where this would put us when you said, Sam, we're kind of right in the range within Brookline, it would just be helpful to know what that meant. But then I guess my question is that if our costs are going up roughly four to four and a half percent, if I heard you correctly, right. and raising tuition 2%, uh, I'm just mindful that we not create a larger structural deficit than we already have by not keeping up because I think in the past we've tried to be just really straddle this very fine line of not wanting to increase too much for all the reasons we said, including financial assistance and, and whatnot, um, and not falling too far behind because then if we fall too far behind sort of the increases, then what happens is we have to take bigger jumps in, in further years to kind of catch up, if you will. And that is seen, you know, again, like the year that we had to go 4%, that wasn't anything we necessarily wanted to, you know, um, contemplate. It, it, and at the same time, we kind of have to keep up. So can you just talk, and this might be a question for Regina also, since you have a little more of the history, it might be Sam, I'm not sure who, or, but just, can you talk us through that a little bit more detail so, so I can kind of wrap my head around it and how we're not going to Basically, how are we not going to fall? Where are we? And then how are we not going to fall behind with, with this approach, I guess? I guess I'll eventually turn it to Regina about the history of the program. Again, the data I have in front of me, again, and counting this year, so there's four increases of uh, four years of increases. Again, it's gone two, four, three, two. Um, so the lowest has been two, the highest has been four. And and there's been a three there. Um, I think it's, you know, and again, this is where I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let Regina in a minute, just because I, she knows the marketplace better. I, I, you know, if we went from two, each point we raise, here's an important thing, and I had mentioned this to Mariah uh, in preparing. 
given the base of what we recognize, every point we raise tuition is $25,000. So um, that's the margin we're talking about. So if we propose the 3%, that would be another $25,000. And it would make the program $112 a year higher. And so, you know, what's that sweet spot? You know, again, looking at, and I think you're right, really, it's looking at Brookline based because that's we're not we're it's, the benchmarking doesn't make sense outside of Brookline for the point you mentioned so you know I guess what are your you know what are your thoughts are our parents price fairly price sensitive not price sensitive what's your take in your experience we have had this conversation but I'd love to hear Regina's thoughts on that yeah so you know, as we're emerging from the pandemic, the landscape is changing on what young families can afford. It's a really difficult, challenging time. That also being said, many families are struggling to find appropriate care and education for their child. Um, I have concerns about access. We've had an increase in requests for financial assistance over and above. As you know, last year, the school committee was fantastic and was able to um, uh, shift some funding by staffing um, to uh, provide those 40 seats for every student who applied on time who was in need. Um, this year, we, we had quite a few um, financial aid applications that we have, you know, we had to do a lottery for the 40 seats. Um, and we're, we're talking about how to do that um, effectively. We've had a little bit of a decrease in our overall number of applicants in certain, particularly at the youngest grade levels. I think families, if families, if people have lost jobs, they're making decisions about sending their child for one year versus two years of pre-K. Um, and we mostly have seen the hit with the, even our youngest applicants are two and a half year olds. So we've had um, less applicants for that, for that piece. And Sam and I have strategized about opening sections if our, if our pool increases on that. Um, and the third thing I wanna say is that we've also had some new centers open in town who have underpriced us. Um, and that is um, a challenge for us. Um, so I, I am concerned about raising it any higher than 2%. David, go ahead. Hi, Regina. You, you just mentioned that there are some other centers that recently opened up that have underpriced us. Are those centers offering, uh, to Susan's point, comparable programming to BEEP or are these more uh, daycare oriented? Um, they would certainly advertise that they are comparable to BEEP and um, have um, a beautiful facility and lots of amenities to offer families. Um, some of them do offer childcare all day um, and extended care, which we do. Um, but yeah, it's it. There we. I think we will feel the hit of it. Helen, before you go, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I think that I, I tend to agree with Susan about this question of um, if our costs are greater than than two percent, then I don't feel very comfortable um, with an increase that is not truly meeting the cost that we need to meet. And I'm also very sensitive to what you said, Regina, about. Um, the increased financial need of some students, not all students, but some students, and how we do a better job meeting the, what is, we'll say alpha, a forecasted need right now. We're meeting the full need um, of, the, of the residents, particularly those residents for whom, there are some residents for whom if they do not get into BEEP, they will go to another private paid program. But there are other residents for whom if they do not get financial assistance and a free program at BEEP, their child will not go to daycare at all. And so to me, I, I feel, I think that we should be, even if not in one year, we should be having a multi-year strategy to look at how we increase the percentage of 
the, per the, the percent increase on BEEP every year to allow us, as Sam said, each percentage point allows for essentially two additional free slots into the BEEP program until we are fully meeting what we see as the community demand for low income, um, high quality child care, day, child care, I guess I'll call it preschool. Um, and so I appreciate that that does not necessarily comport with a 2% um, and the concern about other programs. But I think that when I look at it, I look at the true need of, um, there are other children who can go to these, some of these other programs, but there are very few programs that are gonna provide a free high quality education. And if that is our niche, and there are some, and there are families who still prefer BEEP and want to go at a, at even if it's a six percent or a seven percent tuition increase or a five percent tuition increase this year, then I think that we have an imperative to ensure that we're meeting our costs and also ensure that we're providing um, the service to our most vulnerable students who would not otherwise access it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Helen. Unless you want to respond to that specifically, Regina, I'll let Helen. Um, no, I, I, I'm, I'd be anxious to hear what other people have to say about that and then comment. Helen, go ahead. So, Mariah, I think that it's a little more complicated than you're making it because BEEP is a voluntary program for many parents. And I think we have some competition in town now, um, where we, whereas before we really didn't uh, in terms of what we're able to provide. And I think if they're underpricing us, I don't know by how much, um, Regina, how much is the trust center underpricing us? Uh, my understanding is for a five hour program, they're $10,000. We are four hours and 15 minutes. We're 11 at this year's rate where I should know this off the top of my head, Sam. Is it 11, about 11.4? Eleven 11.2, I think this year, 11.2. So I think that's, you know, there's the, <laughs> the business model too here and making sure that, that we can compete. And if we raise it too much, that won't happen. Um, so I think we really need to be very careful not to drive ourselves out of business, so to speak. I don't think that's happening. I think we have a quality program and, you know, people will continue to come to BEEP and, you know, that's, that's not the issue, but, but I think we have to be careful of where, where that sweet spot is. Cliff, and then we'll go back to Susan and David. Thanks, Robert. First, I want to um, uh, say how pleased I am to hear this conversation and the way it's going. And I, you know, Susan will remember that, um, uh, uh, preschool fees and, and, and other fees were a major topic of conversation back in 2014. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's great to hear the conversation that, that you, you all are having. Um, and to be looking at this as, as a business, as a business that you know, has competition, um, needing to identify what that competition really is, trying to understand you know, where the pricing should be relative to um, the competition, where the demand's coming from for the service, all that type of stuff, how you position yourself, how you market yourself. Um, the one question I have um, uh, is what sort of a waiting list uh, is there for BEEP right now? And I, I appreciate that, that the answer to that question probably has uh, 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 more than one component, a waiting list for people who uh, need assistance versus a waiting list for those people who are willing to pay and may be fairly price insensitive. Um, and understanding that latter category uh, would help inform you um, as to how much you know, latitude you might have to more fully try to recover the cost increases that you're experiencing. Um, but I, I think it's a great conversation. I really appreciate it. I want to make one comment, which you and, and Helen both said, which is this idea of it's a business. And I want to I want to push back against this idea that it's a business. It has it has fees. I'm not asking you to I'm not don't defend yourself. I'm just saying it's not a true business. This isn't a free market. It's not a true business. This is a weird blended model. And we should be 
um, thoughtful before extending any one sort of capitalist concept to this, to this, to, to beep. That's all I want to say. Go ahead, Susan. Yeah. I, so um, I think that there, we, we might be sort of violently agreeing, but using different language. I don't think that, um, it, first and foremost, we are a public system. And so thinking uh, rigorously about our costs and our revenues and our pricing is critical regardless of whether you're a business or not. We are a public system, we have to do all of those things. Um, we have to fundamentally cover our costs with some sort of revenue. Um, and we have to be mindful of what we're offering relative to others. So I, I think that if that's a business, then we're in a business. I think if the question, if a business is defined by, are you profitable or not? Or are you covering your costs? Or are you only going after the most profitable customers? No, of course we're not. So I just wanna, I wanna, uh, hypothesize that we might be actually not disagreeing. Um, but what I wanted to say was, I think there's a, a slightly different dimension to this, which is who is it that we think that we and only we can or should be serving? So I think Mariah, where I heard you going, which is where the conversation was a while back, was look, you know, we don't want a system where, again, strategically speaking, we don't want a system where, you know, a third of our children have special needs and we are supporting them by mandate and also because that's our values. Two thirds don't have special needs and then we're not mandated to serve them. However, um, most of them are low income, um, in which case they face a different set of challenges. I think we've we've worked pretty hard to kind of have a diverse group of kids, um, all kind of of different intersectionalities across the 300. Um, and and 300 might not be the right number. So so I think that when we talk about which kids we feel most strongly need to be served, certainly we have a mandate around children with special needs. We also have I think a, a moral, we feel like we have a moral obligation. I think we have a moral obligation to focus on children who, Mariah, it's a little bit different way to say what you said, but like who, children who, for whom, but for this program would not necessarily have access to high quality, affordable um, uh, early education. Um, and so I think that to the extent that our goal is to serve every child for whom that latter sort of First of all, we don't know who all those kids are in Brooklyn. We don't know how many children there are that that would apply to, um, and we don't know what it would <laughs> what it what it would cost to serve them, or what what it would mean to serve them in terms of revenues. So I think that there's sort of a this year conversation, and then I think we're all, we're always trying to kind of parallel process right now between like what is it that we have to land this year, and then what is it that's kind of on a slightly longer term agenda. And I think what I've heard is that for a slightly longer term agenda, we really do want to kind of get granular about what else is out there. Call it competition, call them peers, whatever you want what they're providing, how many hours, just as Regina said, what their price point is, what they're offering, and and what where that puts us in terms of parents choosing us, because this is a this is for many of the children involved, a choice program. Um, and then sort of thinking about as we think about our mandate to serve and our values, who is it that we feel most needs to be heavily recruited into this program? Um, and what would it cost if we were serving them and we were giving them um, the, the financial assistance they need to be able to come? Um, and that we're not kind of creating this system where it's very, very high income parents. We're kind of hollow in the middle because it's just unaffordable. And then we have very low income and children with special needs. So I think there's just some com complexities about what we want this population to look like. And, you know, after, <laughs> I won't. I, I won't be here for that conversation. Um, I look forward to watching it, but you know, in eight weeks, I, I'm not going to be here anymore. So, so I look forward to all of you having this conversation. I think for me this year, I'm just most concerned about not falling too far behind um, as we as we think through some of those dynamics more strategically in a, in a multi-year view. So, let me let me stop there. I think what I'll add to that to add to the multi-year complexity is also thinking about our program model. So I know Regina will be appreciative here. Uh, you know, the, the thought about full day. Uh, Linus, do you mind speaking up a little bit? It's a little hard to hear you. I'm sorry. Um, I'm in my headphones, so I don't want to sound like I'm yelling. <laughs> is that better? Yeah. Yes, it is better. Um, and I would just say to add to the complexity that um, uh, Susan was just sharing and thinking about our program model, 
what are we actually offering? And then, you know, to add to that multi-year level to start thinking about expanding the day uh, for our pre-K students. And I know that there is conversation brewing around that, but just to add that to the mix as well. Why don't we park that in the parking lot alongside mm -hmm. summer programs for a joint curriculum finance discussion um, for the next year? if that sounds amenable, Regina and Leslie as well. David, why don't you go ahead and then I think we're gonna try and somewhat land this plane before six o'clock. I just had the same question as Cliff regarding the uh, waiting list, how many students wanted to enroll in BEEP uh, and were not able to, and if we know how many among them uh, would have been able to uh, pay tuition. And then secondary to that, Given that our K-12 enrollment is down 11%, do we anticipate having some available classrooms where we could conceivably expand BEEP next year? Okay. Um, I can pull up just a little bit of information. Um, we just, yesterday, big day in BEEP, um, March 1st, we send out our acceptances. So uh, the phone has been ringing off the hook with people excited and people disappointed. Um, we filled, uh, we sent out offers for all, um, uh, we have 20 classrooms which are um, inclusive. Four classrooms are sub-separate, so they are not counting. Of those 20 classrooms, we were able to fill all um, tuition seats or send out offers for all tuition seats in 19 of them. There is one class and Sam and I have strategically discussed um, and I called those families. Um, it is a preschool classroom where um, we didn't have enough enrollment, we felt at this moment in time to say that we could open that class. Our hope is that um, from the waiting list and as people move into town, we will have additional people who apply at the 2.5 year level to join. I think that is where you're seeing some of the drop off and the impact of the pandemic, that people aren't gonna pay for three years of pre-K before um, kindergarten. Um, so, so there's one thing. In terms of our, um, the number of people who applied for financial aid, um, we had 68 families apply for financial aid and we were offered 40 seats. We did a lottery um, uh, and we um, had some priorities um, for that in terms of we obviously funded students who are currently in the classroom, families that we've had um, relationships and who've sent other children to BEEP because that's the same criteria that we use um, for children who are tuition paying. Um, after that, we prioritize four-year-olds over three-year-olds. Very important to us that children have a high quality um, educational experience prior to kindergarten. Um, so th that's where we were. So there were three-year-olds who um, um, did not get funding and similar, um, uh, some of the two and a half-year-olds also. We offer other programs for our top, for our 2.5 year olds. So that, that's the rationale on that. In terms of the waiting list for, um, the waiting list for people who applied who did not request um, financial assistance, I can tell you, hold on, I, I have this multi-tabbed, as you can imagine, I have a multi-tabbed, um, Regina, and just to confirm, these are people who aren't wouldn't be eligible for the youngest kids group because you right right they're older yeah. kids. Okay, so um, uh, so these are tuition paying students. It looks like we have three four year olds that we're unable to offer seats to. In terms of three year olds, um, longer list twenty. Wow. And um, younger children, we have about four. So it's not, I mean, in past years, we would have 100 people on our waiting list. Um, the waiting list is, um, the waiting list is tricky too, because people are very site dependent. Um, they don't want to drive if they live in South Brookline, they don't want to drive to Coolidge Corner School. Um, if that's where an opening is. They want to go to the Putterham School and vice versa. 
And obviously our highest demand is in the North Brookline area. David, was that sufficient? Yes, that was helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Susan, I see your hands up. Very quickly, um, either now or later, I think it would be helpful to know if we were to fully fund financial need for everyone who requested it, how much more in terms of dollars would that be? Because I know different families get different amounts, so we can't just apply a blanket amount. Um, but I think that would be good for us to know if we were to fully fund financial aid, not just 40 slots somehow. And then I think the second question would be, um, are there anything, or, you know, this is part of the longer conversation, but in terms of leases and in terms of kind of other spaces, there are kind of a whole other set of costs. So when we're talking about um, the BEAT program, either being solvent or kind of where, how much we're subsidizing, just making sure that we're being thoughtful about not only operating costs, and again, we have union staff, other people don't, um, but um, not only operating costs, but also the kind of fin incremental financial costs of, of the program. So mm -hmm. I just wanna put that on the radar for the, the longer term question, but just in the near term, it would be helpful to know what fully funding financial need would look like. So 40 seats, fully funding financial aid for 40 seats um, is approximately $467,000. Okay, thanks. So it, if we were carrying the full 68, it would be like roughly 700,000? Yeah, actually I should say the 467 is with the 2% increase um, that Sam and I have discussed. So I'm gonna, propose an amendment to the fee schedule, several amendments to the fee schedule. Before I do, I just want to flag one thing that's on the cover page, which is not, um, we don't get a breakdown on it. And I would like us to, in future years, as we go through the finance policy and some of these other policies that we've talked about, um, the one I'm talking about is the school building, um, the facilities fees for use of those buildings. Yeah. That in the policy is um, said that the staff will define the fees year to year. And I would like to pull some transparency and school committee affirmation. And so in future years, I'd like that bit to um, be part of our vote as well, not for this year, but for upcoming um, votes. Um, for the amendments for this, and this might also provoke significant discussion, but here we go. My amendments are removing the language about uh, reduced lunch, the 30 and 40 cents for respectively breakfast and lunch. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna propose uh, increasing BEEP from 2% to 5%. And 4% of that 5% is to more accurately reflect our cost increase for this year. And 1% is to fund an additional two slots in the tuition assistance program with the idea being that, as Susan said, this is gonna be a multi-year program. We need to think about all of these things going forward, but um, I would like us to continue to grow the side of, um, of that. And we, as Regina just said, we clearly heard there's a much larger demand than the 40 current slots accommodate. So that's my amendment is those two changes, the free reduced lunch and the 5% um, instead of 2% for BEEP. but I need a second from the committee and I can split it if there's an issue, but I need a second before we could vote it. But uh, Mariah, can I propose talking this through a little bit first? Uh, we can, you, you can, can second it. it and then we can talk through it. We can have a discussion once, it's not technically a motion on the floor right now, unless someone's willing to second it. And then you can further amend it. No second, okay, so is it gonna die? Well, maybe, but <laughs> why don't you split it up? Because okay, I might be so I'll to... split it in. I'll split it into two. So the first one is the reduced fee, removing the re reduced fee. Do I have a second on that? Second. Thanks. Okay. Can we get a vote on that, David? Yes. Susan. Yes. Stephen. Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Then why don't we? I'm gonna say, well, I'm thinking about 5% and let's have the discussion before we get to the vote. Go ahead, Stephen, with what you want to say. Okay, so it seems likely that I'm completely in alignment with your values and thinking this through. I just want to understand the mechanics of this a bit better. You're proposing this so that we could better meet the demand for, for parents who can't afford it, right? 
so has there been any any study to determine like the price elasticity of beep for parents who can otherwise afford? like I, I have no clue whether an increase of that level would drive parents away and decrease the revenue base to the extent that we would not be able to fulfill this goal. I, I want to I want to support this value. I just want to make sure that this action does support this value. Or, or can you advise on that, Mariah? Or can you give me some further thinking? Mike, on that? My, I, I, I don't know that we have that data. I mean, we would have, I think, ANIC data from Regina about price sort of sensitivity of parents. But you know, is if if we were proposing a three percent versus a five percent, if people understood that one of those percents was to enable greater participation by families who are who are financially unable to otherwise attend, does that make them less sensitive? There's a lot of moving parts here. I don't know, Regina, do you want to comment on that? Um, I, I do think that five percent would be um, detrimental to our our applicant pool. Um, I think it would be hard. I, I um, as Linus has said, and, and Sam and Linus and I have had discussions, we, we would hope to have full day universal pre-K um, someday. Um, and 5%, I, I just don't see right now for a half day program as meeting the needs of the families. Can, Regina, can you say more about why you think that? Have, have parents said to you that it feels like a financial stretch to them? As it is right now, is is this your is this your impression from yes? It, it is, um, um, well, our applicant pool is down. As I said, in past years, we would have had a hundred people on our wait list. Um, it it seems to me that um, in in that way, and I don't I don't think the quality of the program has suffered. I think people are emerging from the pandemic. People's lives are different, um, and it's hard. Uh, yeah, young families, we're up at, a, we're very high compared to other um, public schools too. We're also talking about the difference between 5% and 2% is 300, just to quantify it for people is $343 a year. Could, could I offer a different way to look at it? And I, I, I do this a lot. I've sat on boards of nonprofits and uh, what I would say a different way to attack it to get to the same end is, and I think it goes fundamental to, can people afford to pay more than nothing? You know, even if it's 5% of the cost or 10% of the cost, I don't know. But, you know, if, if the, you know, so again, we just uh, quantified the value of giving 40 full rides to beep and that's some four hundred and seventy thousand dollars you know each if if people only had to pay five hundred dollars that's 23 that would fund two additional scholarships and we wouldn't have to raise tuition anymore i'm just putting it you know and i there's something to be said for people you know if you if you're not paying anything for it, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they value it, but you know, I guess I'm putting it out there. You know, has that ever been thought of? Well, the other thing I want to flag, I agree with you, Sam. Is I don't know to what extent Regina the sliding scale, how sliding the sliding scale is, and if you put some sort of cost in versus free, that's mm -hmm. one thing. But the other thing is, and I want to be super. There, there's the one percent that we're talking about relating to funding these two scholarships, and then there's just the reality that our programs cost more than 2% as an increase year on year. And we are already talking about the significant, we're gonna to get to the next half of this meeting, which is about the significant, um, the, the cost that we have in sort of baked in cost structures. And the idea that we would be further straining the operating budget by minimizing the 2% private pay, whereas the we're expecting a four per, to four and a half percent um, or even 5% on the public pay, to me, it just seems inappropriate. Just seems inappropriate. You know, these are all, these are all residents of the town and I'm not sure why we would have um, the sort of the tax base expect one amount, but not expect it for people who can afford the private pay. And so at minimum, I would only feel comfortable if we're voting for a 4% increase 
to sort of more accurately mirror these costs? And then the question is this 1% and do people want to support this idea of the scholarship? Susan, go ahead. Good question. Um, if we sent out acceptances yesterday, have we sent out targeted fees for 22, 23 in those letters? We did not. We, okay. um, we indicated that the current tuition is and the school committee would be voting on a re at a re at an upcoming meeting. And right. the one the one percent on this is around one hundred and fourteen dollars. Just so you're, you know, go ahead, Stephen. Can you just remake your point about the additional? I understand that you said the first two percent is just to cover operating costs. Yeah. What's the next two percent? I guess my point. No, it's not two percent. My point is currently the proposal on the table is for two percent increase, and I'm Which saying covers operating costs. No, it doesn't. Uh, it, no, it, we're uh, shorting. We're the proposal uh, says we're not even going to fully cover the increase in our operating costs, and I'm saying I think that's inappropriate. At minimum, we should be we should be increasing it at four percent to more accurately reflect our actual increase in costs. And then this, the only question in my mind, is, I would not vote for less than four percent. I'm sorry. And then the question is, do we go for this additional 1%, which allows for an increase in the scholarships? Thanks, Maria. That was yep. clear. Does that, okay, thanks. David, go ahead. Have we ever gone, uh, have we ever increased tuition by more than 4% in any one year? I think I recall a recent year where it went up exactly four. One year, yes. Sunday. Yeah, I mean, again, one year, what, again, in a five-year look, which has four years of changes, it was a two, a two, a four, a three, and a two. So if you add that all up, that's four, seven, eleven. So over a four-year horizon, the average increase was two point seven five percent, which I would argue in any of those years it didn't keep pace. And in my sense is that was by design to not lose enrollment. And I guess to others' point, I guess we'll really never know because you never know if you went up an extra point or two, were you going to lose an extra two? You know, if you lose an extra five enrollment, then your total revenue goes down. You know, so it's like, what's that? Again, it's it's what that what is that sweet spot? You know, and. You make an educated guess of the market, you know, and, and I think what's to Regina's point, you know, we're coming out of a pandemic and all that goes with it and, you know, wages are going up, but then people, you know, the people, how they work is changing. There's a whole bunch of moving parts and, and you know, we're trying, we're trying to, to, to hit the mark. Uh, you know, I, I can't begin to tell you, you know, where 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 does that supply and demand curve intersect that, you know, maybe 3% doesn't hurt us and 4% does, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't think Regina knows. I guess we'll find out, you know. I'm hoping we can bring this part of this conversation to a close, David. So if you and Susan can go quickly and then we've got to do a vote. I was just going to say that I agree with you, Mariah, that I think at bare minimum, we need to keep pace with our costs. It wouldn't be appropriate otherwise. We don't want to be adding to our um, creating a, a debt, essentially, uh, by not fully funding our costs. Uh, so I would be comfortable with a minimum of four. Five concerns me a bit, given that we've never jumped five in one year. And even though I understand that in terms of raw total, we're looking at just at $300 over a year, which might not seem like a whole lot when you divide it up month by month, day by day. But the optics of going up more than we ever have in recent memory coming out of a pandemic when we have increased competition, I think could be a problem. I would just flag that it's not the $340 is for a 3%. The 1% additional is about 112% or $112. I'm sorry, $113. Susan? Um, when we talk about what is too much, quote unquote, too much that I, and I'm, I understand conceptually the sweet spot, Sam, that you're talking about, but are we thinking that there is a, that one of the prices that we're talking about is going to sort of make, mean that we are actually not running 
a full program, which is different from not having a big wait list. I mean, I, a large wait list is nice and it's for a whole bunch of reasons, but I think there's a difference between the size of our wait list and the size of our enrollment. And um, for sure, the more people who need financial assistance, the fewer people who are paying revenue. But I think, again, that's more of a strategic question. I'm asking more of a, of a numbers question, which is, do we think that enrollment would go below what we are essentially budgeting for in terms of enrollment? I think that's my first question. My second question is, when we say that costs are going up by 4%, does that or does that not include sort of the uh, variable capital cost? Or is that only, is that purely an operating cost question? I would say that's purely an operating cost because the leases, when I say $6 million program, that is not inclusive of the leases for Clark, Putterham, Beacon, any of it. Okay. I just think when we do this fully full costing, I think it's really important to think about, you know, unionized workforces versus not just as a reality, not as a value judgment, just as a reality of this, because our, our base goes up in very different ways from a number of these other programs that we're talking about benchmarking against. So I just I want to say that for the future. But I, I, I just want to make sure that I'm clear on when we talk about, are we talking about going below our budgeted enrollment or are we just saying there are going to be fewer people interested in our program? I think those are different questions. I guess we're budgeting. We're budgeting, well, budgeted enrollment and more importantly for this exercise, budgeted paid enrollment equals budgeted revenues that we're counting on the aforementioned to $2.6 million, I think, you know, and so, you know, that requires at this price point, us having you know, like 230 or so full tuition paying students and if we have less than that then it's potential problem because then it doesn't balance the what we're budgeting for revenue can i make one last comment before we sort of go to a vote on whatever we're going to vote on which is that um that there is a much larger conversation to be had here about what what the program is and for example right now we're paying lease for a much larger, we're not covering costs of a lease that is that exists for a program that we think people can't necessarily afford if we fully, even the operating costs, if we fully load those costs into the program. And so my question is, you know, this is a much bigger question about what BEEP is and what we want it to be and having the strategic vision for where people are sitting and how much those costs go. And we're not gonna solve it tonight, but it's really important that this program actually, um, that we're actually accounting all of that and agreeing on, on, what, on what we want to do with this. Because I don't see like this idea of competing and we might lose market share. I don't necessarily see that as a problem. I personally don't necessarily see that as a problem. We don't want the program to be insufficient, but we also don't need to, we're, we've, we've expanded and run into other buildings and we're carrying like leases of 1.5 million which, which is a significant cost to the, to the capital program. And so what we want to be is really important. Helen, I'm going to put a hold on this because I'm thinking you're talk, want to talk about a lot of leases and other big picture stuff, unless it's like a 30 second comment. Is it a 30 second comment? No, it's a 30 second comment. I, I, I don't agree with what you're saying. Um, we run a program that that makes sure that it is a inclusive program of all types of kids. And that's what the beauty of BEEP is. We could do it like other school systems do where we have 50% of the kids on IEPs and you know, 50% or 49%, you can't have 50, 49% and 51% that aren't. And we, it would probably cost us less and uh, we would have a smaller program. I, that's not what BEEP is about. BEEP, includes kids who are 25% who are on IEPs, 25% who are at risk in some way, whether English language learners, low income, and then another 50% of, of typically developing kids. 
And it's a model. It, it's something. But, uh, but, but I think we're not disagreeing, Helen. What I'm saying is we should be honest about the program costs and fund them appropriately rather than trying to drive it out of tuition revenues, which aren't necessarily going to be able to keep up with this. Okay. And, okay. and we should talk about it honestly, fully understand what we're doing and make a decision. And then the decision, when we put all that math out there, it might not be that the program model that currently exists is the one that's going to thrive, but we should be honest and, and look at it fully so that we all understand the different issues here at play. Can I get a, some sort of a motion out there for 4% or 5%, Stephen? I'd like to make a motion for the 5%. I will second it. Susan, how do you vote? On 5%, no. David? No. Stephen? Yes. And I vote yes. So that was, this is for a recommendation to the full school committee, right? Correct. So that was can for... we then make a follow on motion for the 4%? Yep. Okay, I'd like to make that motion. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, Susan, how do you vote? Yes. David? Yes. Stephen? Yes. And I'm gonna abstain on that one. Like we're modifying the sheet, that's okay. Yeah. But I think, Sam, because um, we're doing this all tomorrow night at school committee again, yep. unfortunately, I'm not going to be there, but um, which is a real bummer. <laughs> I promised my child six months ago I'd go somewhere with her, and now I can't be there. But um, this, I guess, will be a lively conversation tomorrow night. Can I just say to close this off, Mariah, I appreciate you putting values at the forefront of this conversation. This seems like exactly the way to talk about this issue. So thanks. Thanks. I think it was a great conversation um, and uh, more tomorrow, I guess. Helen, before we yeah, go on to- uh, just, just, I'm sorry, uh, one quick thing. Um, I think what Sam was referring to when he was talking about 230 students, there was 230 students uh, that are either um, um, kids with needs or paying students. And then there are 40 students because right there's about 270 that you have uh, Regina is that correct um, that's if you include students who come in for services only in terms of actual seats we have um, about um, I have to look it up well yeah, how many yeah, paying students do we have I guess is the I thought it was like 255 220 okay. 220 are paying mm -hmm. oh Okay, I'm gonna call an end to this bit. Let's go to um, FY23. Um, budget oh. calendar, we don't have an update for. We're gonna go straight to the review of personnel budget. Um, and I think I'm gonna start, and then we're gonna go to um, spreadsheet that you all received a copy of, and then we're gonna go to Linus talking a little bit about the new personnel requests. So we can hear some of the background and justification for those. Any questions on that, Sam? Do you agree with that order of operations? I agree. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm going to pull up some slides really quickly. I just want to give people a quick refresher on how we got to today on personnel. Um, so I just want to remind people that the conversation we've had about staffing levels is really going back, obviously, into the previous fiscal year. And we've had significant conversation ongoing. Um, the quote that you see on the screen right now is from the FY22, which is the current year budget overview that was sent to town meeting almost a year ago, last May. Um, and we talked about this specifically was about the role in staffing and supporting COVID impacts. You know, even before COVID, we've certainly been looking at um, all students who had impacts, but now we're also focusing on COVID specific impacts. Um, we also talked last year, this is also from that same document sent in May 2021, um, about the, the challenges that we're having in terms of enrollment uncertainty, which I think we all would have hoped that by March 2022, we had a greater certainty, but the reality is that we still don't, although we, um, we, we might. We, I think we still feel like we probably have some understanding of some growth, but we don't have that clarity yet. Um, and I just want to highlight this, this um, that this has been an ongoing conversation and thinking about what it means um, to have classes and the idea of um, having a target of 19 students that was the target for last year was 
um, to mitigate both the COVID impacts that were referred to on the previous slide, but also to mitigate against enrollment uncertainty because if the class sizes were brought up and then significant numbers of students returned, um, we would have larger than desirable classes, class sizes. Um, and I just want to quote um, from this year, this is the PSB budget drivers document that was sent to the select board last month, which was also sent to town meeting. And that again, these are ongoing issues, you know, the questions and you see the, um, the first two bullets there. Again, these are the same questions. If and when enrollment will return entirely or nearly to pre-pandemic levels, recovering from pandemic impacts on academics and socio-emotional learning. Um, and that the PSB um, goal of an average of 19 students per section from last year um, is continuing. And um, Linus put that into his um, letter and his materials for the FY23 preliminary budget update. And that is also, um, so that is a continuation from last year, last year's budgeting for this year and this year's budgeting for next year. Um, so I wanted to put that context out there. Um, just to remind everyone, as we talk about personnel, both this week um, and in two weeks, um, that everyone has this sort of these big um, enrollment drivers and, and um, student need drivers on their mind as we think about personnel. With that, I think we can switch over to the um, to the document. Unless there's any questions or comments on any of that, I want to switch over to the to the document that you all received and talk a little bit about the structure of personnel that we're hoping to use to talk about personnel in detail um, next at the next meeting. Go ahead, David. I was going to say that I, I would like to see maybe a little more nuance to our target number for students in the classroom and have it more by grade span because uh, MSBA standard, for instance, is 23 students a class. Now, uh, for kindergartners, 23 might be too much, but for those that are in seventh and eighth grade, 23 could be fine. Uh, and just looking at our current enrollment and our projections for next year, uh, there does seem to be the potential for some consolidations if we have uh, differing target numbers depending on the grade level. I think at this meeting on the 16th, we're going to get an update. Um, Linus, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we discussed getting the update on enrollment at our March 16th and how that might, um, how that plays into some of the classroom sectioning numbers that you're referring to. That's correct. Okay. Uh, let me pull up the documents so that everyone has it. So this is the, and I'm showing this, this is FY23. Let me see if I can make that a little bigger. Um, this is FY23. And there's four columns here, and there's a whole bunch of rows. And what you see in these two columns here um, is the essentially the town appropriation of the, um, the LEA of our budget. And you see both FTEs and dollars. And then um, for the all funds um, approach, which is including revolving funds, grants. Um, That's it. Yep. So that all of that, you can see that there is, again, the um, same question of headcount, FTE headcount, and the dollars for staffing. So this is the FY23 numbers. Um, Sam and I worked on this to think about how we could show people change by meaningful buckets and, and categorize um, people and, and Linus as well. As well. Um, we all looked at this. And so you can see that there's, um, I'm gonna just sort of go through the overall structure of the document. And the goal is to get feedback from the committee on whether this is a useful structure so that the staff can go back and, and fill in the data for um, several fiscal years backwards so that we can see trends over time and have that understanding of where things are going by, by what, again, what we think are meaningful buckets of staff and personnel. Um, so, so the first section you can see there, there's the big, the, the biggest bucket here is student facing educators. And then I'm just gonna show you on the next page, there is then building based and staff support services. And then the last, the third big category is in central administration, which is sort of anyone not primarily student facing or in a school. If we go back to the first category, 
you can see that there's the classroom educators, pre-K, K-5, and then by specialty in the middle and in high school, English language arts, science, social studies, math. Again, these are broken out by six through eight and nine through 12. You can see that there's um, the advisory and um, teacher specialist in regu regular education positions. These are again, broken out into middle and um, high school and then non FTE dollars. So this is again, stipends and subs um, and so forth. And you can see those dollars as well. Going down into specialty, these are grouped by K-12. And again, all of this is up for conversation, but I just want to go through it. You can see library, visual arts, performing arts, world language, ed tech, wellness, athletics, ELE, um, continuing technical education, and then other specialty programs. And then going down into student services, it's not necessarily broken down by each one of these areas. They're all together by pre-K, K-8, 9, 12, district-wide, and then again, stipended costs. And then lastly, in the classroom space, teaching and learning. So this is literacy, math specialists, ed tech. I realize we have ed tech twice. So I need to figure out, did I mess that up? Well, I just, I mean, ed tech, there's Scott Moore ed tech, and then, which is like teaching, you know, ed tech. Yeah. And then there's help desk under Fung Yang that we're carrying in our, in our. But that's, yeah, that's down here. I think I just wrote it here and we'll okay. need to ensure um, but thinking about there's there's no, at least in here, there's no staff anyway, so it must be up above. And then the non-FTE stipended costs that are here. Um, and then building-based support services, you can see custodians, food service, IT, and then admin, and then central admin, and it's um, broken down by these buckets. And so again, the goal of this um, is to have the conversation about, do people find this to be a useful view? How would they improve it? or change it so that between this week and, and two weeks from now, that the, um, the team in the administration and finance office can present us with a multi-year view into personnel that helps us understand trends um, and as they may also relate to changes in enrollment. And I'm gonna stop sharing because I can't see anyone. Mayor, are you just asking us about the categories, whether this category breakdown is the is the, yep, the category Exactly, the categories and the overall structure, you know, the, the columns. Anything you see is up for grabs. Susan, I see your hand is up. Go for it. So first of all, this is so exciting. And I know I have been sort of beating this drum for such a long time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, Mariah, anybody else who made this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, I just, this is so much more helpful. Um, I a couple of quick thoughts. One is that I think it would be helpful to get a little bit more granularity under student services. If there are, because 310 is a lot of FTEs for one line item. So if we can even just say, you know, anything more than like 25 FTEs in a, in a category, I don't know, pick a number, but just 310 FTEs looked, if I, if I saw that right, it looks like a lot for a line item. Um, that would be number one. Number two, um, I think it might be worth for a couple of these, like the admin, building-based admin line. I think principals and VPs are, are different from what I would, from let's say some of the other things in there. So I think it would be helpful to break down that line as well. And it may just be as simple as kind of educational leaders and administrative supports or something. I don't, but yeah. that looked like another thing that would be helpful to disaggregate um, in my mind. Um, and I think the same thing is true for the teaching and learning admin line. That just seems like people are gonna have a lot of questions about what's in there. Um, it's just a lot of, a lot of money. Um, and then my last question is, um, this is sort of just so I'm understanding, there was at least one line item where the LEA column was larger than the all funds column. And I'm not yeah. sure I understood how that's possible. Yeah, that, would, that would need to be investigated. You're right. It should be a subset of the all funds. You're right. Okay, so, okay that would be helpful. Like, it, it was, was the, do you remember up. which one it was? Yeah, uh, actually, I just, saw it I, too. It was non-FTE go up. With subs. Yeah, I subs. think it was. Yeah, yeah the, this one. Yeah, we'll we'll clean that up. Maybe that was transposed in error, but I'll, I'll we'll 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 look at that. 
Great. And I, but I really love sort of a, certainly the top bucket here of just, you know, the educators then broken out by um, department for six through 12 or six through eight and then nine through 12 is very, very helpful. Is there anybody who isn't on here or do we have all, is everybody on here? Everybody should be on here. The only okay. thing I would caution when you talk about headcount, and this is sort of Brookline being special is um, when, especially when you go down to where it says food service as an example, if you go down a little bit, you have FTE and for people like teachers, well, for everybody, I'll make that clear for everybody. Like my office, 11 FTE equal 11 headcount. That's clean. Food service, 31.27 FTE might be, I think it's closer to 45 headcount because of the you know, part-time nature. It just I just want people to be aware. So when you look at that top line number, uh, 1,400 and some odd FTE, you know, headcount's probably closer to 1,600. You know, again, just want people to be aware. So I think that's okay for this round. I'm not sure. And I would just note it in a, as a footnote. I don't think you need to specify it. Um, sorry, that did make me think of one other thing though, which is benefits because this is FTEs and not headcount. Um, I'm assuming benefits are not in here, which is no, fine. No, they're undistributed on the town side. Yeah. Right. So I, so I think we should just sort of have a, um, I mean, there are two ways to deal with it. One is just a per FT, you know, a some sort of allocation, either per FTE or whatever, um, as as just a as a like a markup essentially, and another column on the end. Although that's not going to be right, it's going to be an estimate. So I would probably lean towards not doing that. I would Great. probably lean towards just having a footnote that says this doesn't include um, related include. benefits, which it doesn't. This is yeah. salaries only. Right. And I think in that footnote, though, I would say that our average benefits per FTE is, you know, whatever it is, it was 20,000, whatever the number is, just put that in the footnote. Don't try to distribute it because I think it'll be too, it'll be inaccurate and confusing. The only last com comment I would have, sorry, this is my third only last comment, but <laughs> my third only last comment is there are going to be a couple of these places where people are going to ask like, why is it like that um, when they spend a little more time? So if you go back up to like world language, um, world language is this one. Uh, is 50, yeah, it's 50, 48 FTEs, whereas something like, I don't know, arts, performing arts, well, performing arts and visual arts even together are more like 40. So that could, you know, you have to, we're just going to, some of this is just going to require like a little bit of processing that those are, that's a different kind of educator face, arts, arts and world language um, and wellness or PE is going to be a different kind of student facing thing than something like um, library services, because library services, we have one per, you know, one plus per building, whereas th some of those other ones are classroom positions, um, and they're driven not by building as the as the driver. They're driven by number of students um, or number of classrooms, I should say. Um, so some of these just have different. The, the only reason I'm saying this is that some of these have different drivers. So you're going to have potentially like things that are off by fifty percent or or something, and and. Just we, I think we should just be able to kind of talk through some of the different things going on here, but it, it doesn't. What do you look mean by off me. by fifty percent? I don't quite understand. Me that. Meaning, like you know, why is library services thirteen and world language fifty? Got it. So just the drivers. And there's a reason that, why. Yeah, the, no, I don't the think it's wrong. There's a reason why, but I think we have to be able to speak them. to it. Yeah, exactly, because it's this. It's staffed totally differently, and it all looks. You just sort of wonder, well, why aren't we being equitable across? And that's not really what's happening. And I think you'd get to kind of a different thing here if, if once we have better, uh, better visibility into kind of literacy um, and math. But anyway, this is so exciting. Thank you, thank you, Sam. You're welcome. Thank Renan too. Thank you, Renan. There's a lot of work you put into it. Uh, Stephen. <laughs> Stephen. Um. Thanks. I I am, um, I'm hearing what you're saying, Sam, your cat, oh, first of all, yeah, this is amazing. I'm thrilled this exists. Um, Sam, I'm hearing your caveat and Susan, you're essentially your caveat as well. And I, uh, two questions. One, you can't apply this retroactively, can you? You can't figure out, you can't figure out the, the previous data points and then, and then extrapolate a trend line from that? Or is this just, is this just a forward-looking 
Um, I, 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 well, I think certainly the goal is to at least go back one year and, and that's something we're prepared to do by the 16th. You know, it, I will say, you know, it's, a, it's a lot of, and we're not afraid of work. It's not that it's just literally the, the way the data was captured, it has to be stripped down to it, to you know, it's like stripping a, a building down to the studs and then rebuilding, you know, to have apples to apples. Because the worst thing we can do, because we took a first, you know, Renan started to do 22. And some of the numbers that came back, you know, until it was going to, you think we have questions tonight now. And it's like, you know, so it's like, it didn't, it wasn't ready for prime time. But Certainly two weeks from now, it, I can promise at least 22, the year we're in, we can have apples to apples to, to begin the trend. I'd like to go further back, but I can guarantee at least 20, okay. 22. Okay, so, so then I would share your concern that a document like this could drive misleading conversations as people will just seek out denominators, whether it's kids or... Um, uh, salaries, and then may, and draw mistaken conclusions based on that. I so I'm wondering if this wouldn't be better with one, but not both, of FTE and dollar amounts, so that this is strictly a trend line focused document that you could track over time the growth or contraction of departments, and people aren't tempted to um, divide dollars by FTEs. Uh, find other ways to maybe that maybe that's a meaningless change it, well i don't I, think I'm that's a to... meaningful change in my opinion and i also think that in the interest of transparency we should be showing it now i agree with susan and we have some of this data from our discussions last year as remember last year for those who are on the committee we had the budget model that i worked on with mary ellen that gives a lot of the sort of drivers in terms of national standards for x right like number of librarians per, there's a there's a number there's a way that we can figure out we need to have you know one student one nurse per x students we need to have you know there's all this all of this is legitimate and maybe the thing to do is actually i can i can put in a little bit of like a quick explainer for people of you know which would help to susan's point sort of why do we only have 13 librarians versus this now someone might want to quibble with, well, I think we should have two librarians for building. That's a reasonable discussion, but at least it starts to explain the background of some of these numbers. Right, so you're basically saying put in benchmarks. Correct. I mean, I, I, mean, I think that if we're going to from a, sorry, Sam, I'm gonna, <laughs> if All right. I've, I sort of, I truly believe in this zero-based budgeting model, which is we should be really asking for what we need and looking at it from with fresh eyes every year. And from that perspective, having benchmarks and reaffirming that you need those things every year, it's 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 important to double check and to make sure that those are the that there's true drivers behind these costs. And I think that that all ties to that. Yeah, all I was going to offer, and I thought you were heading in a little bit different direction, but being the kind of district that the public schools of Brookline is, any minimums. Brookline far exceeds any any minimum standard. I mean, the minimum standard for nurses. Sometimes. No, I, I would say almost. You, you technically only have to have one nurse in the in the in the district. I mean, so you know, as an example. Now there might be what Brookline would like to have that's even far further ahead than than where Brookline is. I can't speak to that, but. Um, where I thought you were heading is certainly people can take, you know, and it depends on the mix of personnel to get an average, okay, the average math teacher per FTE makes X and the average science teacher makes Y. And it just happens to be where the, where, you know, if you had a scattered, you know, where those people sit on the salary scale in any particular department. You know, and I, again, I think that is what it is, but um, I leave it to others. But I think, you know, certainly by any minimum standard, I'd like to think Brookline would measure mostly favorably. 
Certainly favorably to a minimum standard, but possibly not as excessively generous as one might think. I want to go quickly to Andy and Susan, then I'm going to ask that any further comments people share with me offline on the structure of this um, so that we leave plenty of time for Linus to talk about the new personnel requests. Andy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mariah. Uh, my question is very quick. Just uh, would it be possible to separate out uh, paraprofessionals from unit A educators or in the categories where that's applicable? I yeah, I mean, I think that's something that can be done. Yeah. Susan? I was just going to say that the reality is that every salary is a public document. So if somebody wants to defoia it, they can get 1,400 salaries and do their own coding. So I think it's probably just easier for us to present the data in a way that we think is meaningful, tran transparent without being confusing. Um, but I think the data is available anyway. So it's not, people are going to, if they want to do that digging, they're going to do it or they've already done it. So. And to that point, Patch posted the entire Town of Brookline data, salary data this week with a downloadable Excel. So it's out there and it, I mean, it's not a secret and there's no need to, I think, be secretive about it. Um, okay, why don't we, I, I really appreciate the comments. I took notes on the comments that I heard, Susan's three last comments and plus some other comments. Um, and again, but I, what I would ask is that any more comments people have, and that includes from our advisory committee colleagues. Cliff, I think you're the only one here, but if you have any other comments on formatting, send them pretty quickly, because again, the staff, as Sam mentioned, has um, there's a lot of manual work to conform to this kind of structure. Um, and we wanna make sure that it's uh, in place early enough that they can actually do it and not redo it. Thanks. Um, okay, so now we're going to turn it over to Linus for the last part of the agenda, which is discussion around the um, the new proposed positions. Thanks. If you're talking, Linus, we can't hear you. I, can you all see it? We can see it, yep. Awesome. So, this is the joy of working on one screen now. But I can't hear you well again. <laughs> Can you hear me? Second. <laughs> that seemed better now. Now it's good? To... Yeah, that's much better. Perfect. All right, uh, I'm clicking and I didn't mean to. Okay, so here are the uh, new proposed positions that we shared with you uh, that are consistent with what's in the budget book. And so what we um, have done is looked through each of the positions to state sort of the rationale uh, behind each one. Uh, certainly one of the uh, commitments that we've made is investments in early education. And uh, my initial thinking around that was looking at uh, certainly the pandemic uh, impact uh, on our kids. Um, we certainly have uh, paraeducators that support our kindergarten classrooms. But in my school visits, um, our first grade educators uh, shared with me uh, the need or the, the loss that they felt by not having uh, the additional paras um, in the classroom or having the paras in the classroom and certainly um, uh, we want to make sure that our kids get off to a solid foundation. And I think this is a, a resource or support that would help uh, help us in that. And certainly Leslie can add additional color if need be there. Um, in terms of looking at the Office of uh, uh, the English Learner Education Office and Assistant Program Director, uh, we think we've certainly uh, seen the growing needs of our population uh, here. And while we do uh, have experienced a certainly a dip in enrollment, uh, that does not um, also equate to the work or the required work that's done in terms of testing, placement, reclassification um, of our ELE uh, students. And so uh, following them completely through uh, as they transition, uh, as they transition or grow in our system require some of the supports. And so right now with uh, just a program director, um, we see and feel a strain on that particular department. 
we've had uh, ample conversations already around the Office of Equity. Um, and for the proposition here is to add uh, an, an additional staff member to the Equity Office um, and certainly assisting our current uh, director there, uh, Janae Utaro, with the work that we're attempting to do in the system. Um, and a clerical support uh, would be a halftime clerical partner or, uh, with, um, with our strategy and performance office. Um, I think that comes a little bit later. Um, certainly in looking at our um, Office of Students uh, Services uh, and the ETF, I see a typo there. Uh, an ETF, um, certainly our special education um, department will be getting that uh, finalized report hopefully uh, in another week or so and be sharing it out with you all on the 24th, but certainly we're seeing an increased need in special education services in the system. Um, I think um, we're, we're gonna see some data that shows that the number of tests uh, that are done uh, in Brookline uh, is relatively high uh, compared to other systems uh, around this size. And again, um, the amount of need that we have in our system um, is reflective of this request. Um, again, looking at our um, Office of Student Support, uh, K-8 Guidance Council, uh, an additional guidance uh, director uh, to support um, the increasing needs, certainly um, new or adjusting, adjusted Title IX regulations um, is here. So we have some additional justification and we will be sharing this with you. Um, but again, we can't stress enough the mental health needs that have uh, surfaced as a result of uh, all of the pandemic experiences here. And so we want to, again, propose uh, positions that we feel would uh, definitely benefit uh, the system, the organization, and certainly the students. And looking at the Human Resources Office, um, um, what we are finding, uh, and again, uh, hopefully the, the findings, uh, when you see those will help uh, additionally justify some of these pieces. But um, our, our, we're lacking um, roles to actually do much of the work. So often when I hear uh, Steve and say, well, have we done a study or have we analyzed this type of thing? I'm like, yeah, that would be a nice thing to do if we had the resources. Uh, to do those types of things. And so when we're thinking about human resources, there is a body of work. And right now, the, the question is, um, adding this will certainly expand what we are capable of doing. But right now, there are just things that don't get done because we are, are missing some uh, of these resources. The, <laughs> the Office of Strategy and Performance this is the clerical position that I mentioned that was partnered with uh, the Office of Equity. And then Fung has um, certainly uh, seen the need for additional support with the, IT, the increases in the IT department uh, that have grown. Uh, the IT needs that have uh, grown as a result of the one-to-one -one technology as such across the system. So these, and I'm happy to share uh, this document uh, with you all after uh, this evening so that you can take a closer look at it. Uh, and I believe that's everything. Um, so these are the, um, the, the thinking behind the various positions that we've requested, uh, certainly there. And again, recognizing the, uh, the, our current financial uh, status that we're in, in terms of the $130.6 million request at the $124.8 million allocation, uh, recognizing that there is quite a bit of work to do um, to bridge that gap. And, um, you know, there'll be lots of questions and I can anticipate what some of those are. Uh, well, what are you going to exchange in order to get uh, some of these? And that work is, uh, ongoing right now. We're certainly uh, working toward the efficiencies as such. Um, and certainly here the concerns around enrollment, certainly here the concerns around the structural deficit, all of those pieces. And um, some of the questions around, well, should we stop doing that? And the answer is, I can't tell you yet because I haven't done a full analysis of uh, uh, some of the, um, the ads or the, the programmatic pieces that are in the system right now. So. 
with that, I'll stop talking and stand for any questions that you may have there, or if you need me to say more about something. Linus, do you mind just clarifying a little bit about what you said at the end? Um, are you are you thinking about um, if the if ultimately there is insufficient funds? Are you thinking about um, finding space for these positions and finding other things to remove, or you're thinking about deferring these positions um, and sort of keeping other things in place? Great question. So yes to all of those. Um, so it's sort of the order of operations. What do we need to turn on right now um, as, a, as a high priority need? Um, I would certainly say um, the, the positions that are student facing or touching the students is one. Um, certainly our equity office, the request there is a big one for me and looking at um, either the need for special education um, and or the Office of English uh, Learners, uh, um, the ELE office. So um, what can we bring on right now? And then what are those that we can identify to bring on at later times? Like I've had a conversation with Fung uh, since this um, uh, has been publicized and she said, well, actually she's thinking that her position can be put in, uh, in abeyance until next year. So that's not something that we have to put on right now. So those types of efficiencies that we can gain in that regard will do, uh, will do that. Um, and then thinking about these positions are in need and um, we'll continue studying those that we can't bring on right now, but um, we've gone through a careful process to identify what, what's missing from our system right now. Thank you. Comments? from the committee or other members of the school committee? Helen. Uh, so I, the, the one piece that I would like to put in uh, just a, a, a exclamation point to is uh, the ELE uh, um, position. Um, Mindy Paolo came to us over two years ago saying she needed help the state regulations have changed and there's a huge, huge amount of um, backlog and, and uh, things that they have to fill out, you know, provide for the state throughout the year, testing that has to be done. Um, that once more, it's an unfunded mandate by the state. I don't know if those of you who are around when we talked to our legislators about this two years ago. So um, I, I would be very supportive of that. I also think that we need to really find a lot of efficiencies. I think mm -hmm. that we can't, you know, that gap is a big gap. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Leslie? I was just gonna piggyback on what Helen said. Um, thank you, Helen. Um, I'm happy to go over, um, there are really six um, pretty high leverage changes um, to the EL guidelines and legislation um, that are further increasing the demands on the EL department. Um, so I don't wanna um, say what's already been said, but I'm happy to walk through um, those points with the committee if they'd like at any time. I think it would also be helpful in addition to sort of the state mandates, understanding to the number of students that are in the ELE program and how that's changed over time, because I, it could be changed in the past couple of weeks, but I think I went to go look at the ELE page on the K-12 website and it was, I think three years, like the data has not been refreshed in three years, which I totally get because we are, you know, people have been busy probably doing all the forms that we're talking about, but it is helpful for at minimum the school committee to get some of that data to understand not just the moving parts of state demands, but also just students being serviced by the department too. We talk a lot about how enrollment has been primarily driven by international students not showing up, but I haven't seen how that, at least I don't recall ever seeing how that clearly affects ELE enrollment because not every international student is a ELE student and, and vice versa, right? So how we, um, I, I just would find that very helpful also. 
Sure, I, I can certainly do that. And just to give you a kind of quick um, overview, in 2019, we had, um, hold on one second, I was just looking at the data, 833 EL students in 2019. And as of February 18th, 2022, we have 704. So it's gone down, but right not only by like 150 students? Am I About, yeah. yes. Okay. And how many FTEs that work there? Um, in the EL department, um, three. In, in, in terms of the central including office. Including a secretary, right? So there's. Yes. Correct. So there's two. Well, there's still three, but yeah. Um, other questions, comments on other aspects of the, the proposals that have been presented? Leslie, that's an old hand, right? Yeah, okay. Helen, go ahead. Um, I, it would be helpful for me to understand the sort of um, larger structure of guidance and you know why we're asking for the K through eight guidance uh, coordinator. Um, Can I jump in, Mariah? Go for it. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Thanks for that. Helen, um, <clears throat> Linus mentioned a bit of this too, is with the um, new-ish, it's been a few years now, um, Title IX regulations, the investigations have to, um, they take a, a, a bit more time, a considerable amount of time. Um, in, in our district, um, Brian Poon is the trained Title IX investigator for the high school, and Maria Litas is the one who's trained um for the for all of the k to eights um we've seen an increase in um not just title IX investigations um but more complex bullying investigations um title six investigations also across the district in recent years um and in, and i mean maria does a fantastic job they're very thorough um, and informative and obviously unbiased comprehensive investigations so that takes up a lot of her time and then this year having added an assistant director under her and then nine adjustment counselors under her it it essentially stretches her role even more so and where we've seen the pressure points unfortunately is that our k-8 to school counselors get less supervision and development and coaching um which we've been lucky in that they're all pretty strong and they seek professional development and they do have monthly meetings with Maria and Matt, but we could and should be doing more. There is a coordinator, as you all know, um, at the high school level uh, with Darby um, Neff Veer. And so what I'd like to do is to mimic that position, but at the K-8 level, focused on supporting our school counselors. Um, Matt leads SEL and he's obviously overseeing the adjustment counselors. He's picked up some of the um, school counselor support um, but it's just not enough at this point. Um, I should add also that Maria's pick, uh, you know, her role is almost like a Swiss army knife because oftentimes when we get these complex cases, they're not strictly title or cleanly title nine. Sometimes as she digs, she realizes actually this might fall into title six and it might actually be bullying too. So we're running three different investigations and it may involve, you know, more and more people as you investigate. And we're seeing more of that. Um, um, so that that's the, the, the rationale there. Other questions or comments from the people here? I, I would just tag on to the request from Helen that I think, um, as we've all talked about, being a commitment to social emotional support for students, and it would be helpful to um, maybe even in budget book 1.1, which I think is going to be there anyway, but like the org chart of what is happening in guidance um, mm -hmm. and just having this understanding that role and the request there, what that position, how it slots into just the overall org chart will be helpful. Helen, did you have your hand up? Yeah, and, and could it be one K through 12 
coordinator for guidance, for instance. You I think mean, we have a nine to 12 now, right? We do in Darby. Yeah. Right, but there's sometimes we have K through 12 and sometimes we have K through eight and nine through 12. And what we used to at least, I don't know, performing arts used to be K through 12 um, and a couple other coordinators positions. Got it. Are you suggesting having the, the new coordinator role rather than it be focused on K to eight for it to be K to 12 in addition to Darby? Mm, no, I was thinking maybe that role could be expanded. I don't know. I don't want to take people. And I'm not talking about people in it. I'm talking about just the role. Could the coordinator role be K through 12 so that we um, maximize the, the ability to to have a person. Uh, sure, I understand. Yeah, we can certainly um, look at that. I think um, uh, going back to the comments that were made earlier on the budget spreadsheet, one of the things that um, Susan said, which I think is very true, is that when we look at the, for example, the K-8 staffing in student services, there's like 300 and something people in that one bucket. And, and just to draw a parallel, I, I, I don't know how many of them fall into the, um, the counseling group, but my expectation is that there's a lot more people than the parallel to performing arts um, or to some of the other K-12 coordinator positions. And we might end up with one person supervising 50 people, whereas the other K-12 positions are, are supervising 15 to 20. And I'm not saying that's the case, I'm saying that, but this is helpful that we will start to have some data on that spreadsheet that lets us talk about those kinds of things. Um, Okay, it's 6.57, we have the opportunity if no one else has anything to say to be done three minutes early. Okay, thank you everybody for the conversation. It was really great. Um, and I think the- and Can I as, just say one thing? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I did good news. MSBA approves the Pierce School, so. Great. <laughs> just some good news, sorry. Go ahead That's good. We go always ahead. like good news. Um, so we'll come back to finance in two weeks from today. It's 4 to 6 p.m., not 5 to 7 p.m. And then tomorrow night at school committee will be the discussion of fees, the further discussion of fees and the final vote. Thanks, everybody.